section 17 of the convivio this is a librivox recording all librivox recordings are in the public domain for more information or to volunteer please visit librivox.org recording by k hand the convivio by dante alighieri translated by philip h wicksteed treatise 4 chapters 14 through 17 the error of others having been refuted in that part wherein it rests upon wealth in that part wherein it asserted time to be a cause of nobleness saying of ancient wealth and this refutation is conducted in that part which begins nor will they have it that a base man can become gentle and the first this is refuted by an argument of the very ones who are in this error then for their greater confusion this argument of theirs is itself also refuted and this is done when it says further it followeth from what i have above set down finally the conclusion is reached that their error is manifest and therefore it is time to turn to the truth and this is done where it says wherefore to sound intellects and the rest i say then nor will they have it that a base man can become gentle and here be it known that it is the opinion of the erring ones that a man once churl may never be called gentle and a man who is the son of a churl in like manner may never be called gentle and this shatters their own doctrine when they imply that time is required for nobleness by inserting that word ancient for it is impossible in the process of time to come to the moment that begets nobleness according to this their argument that has been rehearsed which precludes a churl from being ever able to become gentle for aught that he may do or by any accident and precludes the passage from a churl father to a gentle son for if the son of a churl is only a churl then his son again is only the son of a churl and therefore his son too is a churl and so we shall never at all be able to find the point at which nobility begins by process of time and if the adversary bent on making some defence should say that nobility begins at the point of time when the base state of the ancestors is forgotten i say that that is counter to them themselves for of sheer necessity there would at that point be a transition from churlishness to gentleness either of the same man from one into the other or between father and son which is contrary to what they lay down and if the adversary were stubbornly to defend his case by saying that they admit that this change can take place when the base estate of the ancestors has fallen into oblivion although the text takes no heed of this it is right that the gloss should answer it and therefore i answer thus that from the contention of theirs follow four extreme absurdities so that the argument cannot be good the first is that the better human nature became the harder and the slower would the generating of gentleness be which is the greatest absurdity inasmuch as a thing is the more mindful in proportion as it is better and is a greater cause of good and nobleness is counted amongst things that are good and that this would be so is thus proved if gentleness or nobleness by which i mean one and the same thing were generated by oblivion nobleness would be the sooner generated in proportion as men were more forgetful for thereby all forgetfulness would come the quicker therefore the more forgetful men were the sooner would men become noble and counterwise the better memory they had the more slowly would they be ennobled the second is that this distinction between noble and base could not be made with respect to anything except men which is highly absurd inasmuch as we recognize in every kind of thing the features of nobleness or baseness so that we often speak of a noble horse and a base one and a noble falcon and a base one and a noble pearl and a base one and that this distinction could not be made is thus proved if oblivion of base ancestors is the cause of nobleness then in cases where there has never been any baseness of ancestors there cannot be any oblivion of them inasmuch as oblivion is the perishing of memory so that in these aforesaid animals other than man and plants and minerals baseness and loftiness cannot be traced since their nature holds them to one only and equal state and in their generation there can be no nobleness and so neither any baseness inasmuch as these two are to be regarded as habit and privation which are possibilities of one identical subject and therefore in these things there can be no distinction between one and the other and if the adversary should choose to say that in other things nobleness means the excellence of the thing 
but in men it means the memory of their base condition has perished one would wish to answer not with words but with a dagger to such a stupidity as it would be to assign excellence as the cause of nobleness in other things and oblivion as its principle in the case of men the third is that the thing generated would often come before the thing generating which is utterly impossible and this may be shown as follows let us suppose that gerardo de camino had been the grandson of the basest churl that ever drank of the sile or the cognano and that oblivion of his grandfather had not yet come about who should dare to say that gerardo de camino would have been a base man and who would not agree with me and say that he was noble of a surety no one howsoever presumptuous he might be for noble he was and so will his memory be for ever and if oblivion of his base ancestor had not come about as is urged in the objection and he had been great in nobility and his nobleness had been thus openly perceived as openly perceived it is it would have existed in him before that which generated it had come about and this is supremely impossible the fourth is that a man should be held noble when dead who was not noble when alive than which there can be no greater absurdity and that this would follow is shown thus let us suppose that in the age of dardanus the memory of his base ancestors survived and let us suppose in the age of laomedon this memory had perished and oblivion had taken its place according to the opinion we are attacking laomedon was gentle and dardanus was a churl when they were alive we to whom the memory of their ancestors i mean beyond dardanus has not come down are we to say that dardanus was a churl when he was alive and is noble now that he is dead and the report that dardanus was the son of jove is nothing counter to this for it is a fable to which in a philosophical discussion we should give no heed and at any rate if the adversary should choose to take his stand on the fable verily that which the fable veils destroys all his arguments and thus it is manifest that the argument which laid down oblivion as the cause of nobleness is false and erroneous chapter fifteen when the ode has disproved on their own teaching that time is demanded for nobleness it straightway goes on to confound their aforesaid teaching itself so that no rust may be left by their false arguments upon the mind which is disposed to the truth and this it does when it says further it followeth from what i have above set down and here be it known that if a man cannot become gentle from a churl and neither can a gentle son be born from a base father as was laid down above in their opinion one of two absurdities must follow the one is that there is no nobleness the other is that there has always been a multiplicity of men in the world so that the human race is not descended from one single man and this can be demonstrated if nobleness is not begotten anew and it has been said above repeatedly that their opinion involves this because it allows not its derivation from a base man to himself nor from a base father to his son a man is always such as he is born and he is born such as its father and so this transmission of one single condition has come down from the first parent wherefore such as was the first generator to wit adam such must the whole human generation needs be for from him to the moderns there is no room to find any change according to this argument wherefore if adam himself was noble we are all noble and if he was base we are all base which is no other than to take away the distinction between these conditions and so to take away the conditions themselves and this is what the words that we be all gentle or else simple declare must follow from what has gone before and if this be not true then of sheer necessity some folk must be reckoned noble and some reckoned base and since the change from baseness to nobleness is ruled out it follows that the human race is descended from diverse origins that is to say one noble origin and one from base and this is what the ode declares when it says or that man had not an origin that is to say one sole origin for it does not say origins and this is most false according to the philosopher according to our faith which may not lie according to the religion and ancient belief of the gentiles for although the philosopher does not lay down the succession from one first man yet he will have it that there is one only essence in all men the which diverse origins could not produce and plato has it that all men depend on one only idea and not on several which is giving one sole origin to them and without doubt aristotle would laugh aloud if he heard folk making two species of the human race like that of horses and of asses or 
for with apologies to aristotle those who so think might at any rate be considered the asses that judged by our faith which is to be preserved absolutely it would be most false as is clear from solomon who when he makes a distinction between all mankind and the brute animals calls the former sons of adam and this he does when he says who knows whether the spirits of the sons of adam go up and those of the beasts go down and that it was false according to the gentiles behold the witness of ovid in the first of his metamorphoses where he treats of the constitution of the world according to the pagan belief or that of the gentiles saying man was born he does not say men man was born whether the artificer of things made him of divine seed or whether the new-made earth but lately darted from the noble ether retained the seeds of the kindred heaven which mingled with the water of the stream the son of aeptus that is prometheus composed in the likeness of the gods who govern all where he manifestly lays it down that the first man was only one and therefore the ode says but this i grant not that is that man had not an origin and the ode adds neither do they if they be christians it says christians and not philosophers or gentiles though their opinions too are against them because the christian doctrine is of greater vigor and crushes all cavil thanks to the supreme light of heaven which illuminates it then when i say wherefore to sound intellects tis manifest that what they say is vain i draw the conclusion that their error is confounded and i say that it is time for eyes to be open to the truth and this i tell when i say and now i would declare how i regard it i affirm then that it is plain to sound intellects by what has been said that these utterances of theirs are vain that is to say without marrow of truth and i say sound not without cause wherefore be it known that our intellect may be spoken of as sound or sick and i mean by intellect the noble part of our soul which may be indicated by the common term mind sound it may be called when not impeded in its activity by ill either of mind or of body which activity consists in knowing what things are as aristotle says in the third of the soul for as to sickness of soul i have perceived three terrible maladies in the mind of man one is caused by boastfulness of nature for many are so presumptuous that they suppose themselves to know everything and therefore they affirm uncertain things as certain the vice which tully chiefly denounces in the first of the offices and thomas in his against the gentiles where he says many are so presumptuous in character as to believe they can measure all things with their intellect considering everything true that approves itself to them and everything false which does not and hence it is that they never come at learning believing that they are learned enough of themselves they never ask questions they never listen but desire that questions should be asked of them and before the question is well out they give a wrong answer and of these solomon says in the proverbs hast thou seen a man swift to answer from him folly rather than correction is to be looked for the second is caused by abjectness of nature for there are so many obstinate in their abasement that they cannot believe that anything can be known either by themselves or by any other and such never search or argue for themselves nor care at all what any other says and against them aristotle discourses in the first of the ethics saying that they are incompetent students of moral philosophy ever like beasts do such live in grossness without hope of any instruction the third is caused by frivolity of nature for there are many of such frivolous fancy that they dash about wherever they argue reaching their conclusion before they have formed their syllogism and flying from this conclusion to another and fancying all the time that they are arguing most subtly and they start from no axioms and never really see any one thing truly in their imagination and of them the philosopher says that we should take no heed nor have aught to do with them saying in the first of the physics that with him who denies the axioms it is not meet to dispute and amongst such are many unlettered who would not know their a b c and would fain discuss geometry astrology and physics and by reason of sickness or defect of body the mind may be unsound sometimes by defect of some principle from birth as in the case of idiots sometimes by disturbance of the brain as in the case of maniacs and it is this malady of mind that the law contemplates when the enforciatum says in him who makes a testament soundness of mind not of body is required at the time in which the testament is made wherefore it is to those intellects which are not sick by malady of mind or body but are free and unencumbered and sound with reference to the light of truth that i say it is manifest that the opinion just spoken of is vain and without worth 
then it adds that i thus pronounce them false and vain and thus refute them and this it does when it says and thus do i refute the same as false and afterwards i say that we are to proceed to demonstrate the truth and i say that we are to demonstrate this to wit what gentlehood is and how a man in whom it exists may be recognized and i say this here and now i would declare how i regard it chapter sixteen the king shall rejoice in god and all those who swear by him shall be praised because the mouth is shut of those who speak unjust things these words i may verily here set forth because every true king ought supremely to love the truth wherefore it is written in the book of wisdom love the light of wisdom ye who are before the peoples and the light of wisdom is truth itself i say then that every king shall rejoice because that most false and pernicious opinion of mischievous and erring men which they have hitherto unrighteously spoken concerning nobleness has been refuted it is fitting to proceed to treat of the truth according to the division made above in the third chapter of the present treatise this second part then which begins i affirm that every virtue in principle proposes to determine about nobleness itself according to the truth and this part is divided into two for in the first the intention is to show what this nobleness is and in the second how he in whom it resides may be recognized and this second part begins the soul which this excellence adorns the first part has again two parts for in the first certain things are investigated which are necessary for the comprehension of the definition of nobleness in the second the definition itself is sought and this second part begins gentlehood is wherever there is virtue to penetrate completely into the treatment we must first perceive two things the one what is understood by this word nobleness simply considered without qualification the other is by what road we are to travel to find the above named definition i say then that if we would have regard to the common custom of speech this word nobleness means the perfection in each thing of its proper nature wherefore it is not only predicated of man but of all other things as well for a man calls a stone noble a plant noble a horse noble a falcon noble whenever it appears perfect in its own nature and therefore solomon says in ecclesiastes blessed the land whose king is noble which is to say no other than whose king is perfect according to the perfection of mind and of body and this he clearly shows by what he says before when he says woe unto thee o land whose king is a child that is to say not a perfect man and a man is not a child simply in virtue of age but in virtue of disorderly ways and defect of life as the philosopher instructs us in the first of the ethics it is true that there are foolish ones who believe that by this word noble is meant named and known by many and they say that it comes from a verb which means to know to wit nosco and this is most false for if this were so those things which were most named and known in their kind would be the noblest in their kind and so the obelisk of st peter would be the most noble stone in the world and astente the cobbler of parma would be nobler than any of his fellow citizens and alboino de la scala would be more noble than guido de castillo of reggio whereas every one of these things is most false and therefore it is most false that noble comes from knowing but it comes from not vile wherefore noble is as much as not vile this perfection is what the philosopher himself means in the seventh of the physics when he says everything is most perfect when it touches and reaches its own proper virtue and it is then most perfect according to its nature wherefore the circle may be called perfect when it is really a circle that is to say when it attains to its own proper virtue then it exists in its full nature and then it may be called a noble circle and this is when there is a point in it which is equally distant from the circumference that circle which has the figure of an egg loses its virtue and is not noble nor is that which has the figure of an almost full moon because its nature is not perfect in it and so it may be plainly seen that in general this word to wit nobleness expresses in all things the perfection of their nature and this is the first thing we are in search of the better to enter into the treatment of the section which we are about to expound secondly we were to see how we are able to travel in order to discover the definition of human nobleness which is the scope of the present process i say then that inasmuch as in those things which are of one species as are all men we cannot define their best perfection by essential principles we must define and know it by the effects they manifest and so we read in the gospel of saint matthew when christ says 
beware of false prophets by their fruits ye shall know them so the straight path leads us to look for this definition which we are searching for by way of the fruits which are moral and intellectual virtues whereof this our nobleness is the seed as shall be fully shown in the definition thereof and these are the two things which it behoved us to perceive before proceeding to the rest as said above in this chapter chapter seventeen now when these two things are understood which it seemed advantageous to understand before proceeding with this text we are to go on to expound the text itself it says then and begins i affirm that every virtue and principle cometh from one root i mean virtue that maketh man blessed in his doing and it adds this is according as the ethics say a selective habit setting forth the whole definition of moral virtue according as it is defined in the second of the ethics by the philosopher and the chief stress of this is on two things the one is that every virtue comes from one principle the other is that this every virtue means the moral virtues which are our subject and this is manifest when it says that is according as the ethics say where be it known that our most proper fruits are the moral virtues because in every direction they are in our power and they have been distinguished and enumerated diversely by diverse philosophers but inasmuch as wherever the divine opinion of aristotle has opened its mouth methinks that every other's opinion may be dropped purposing to declare what they are i will briefly pass through them and discourse according to his opinion these are the eleven virtues named by the said philosopher the first is called courage which is weapon and rein to control rashness and timidity in things which bring destruction to our life the second is temperance which is rule and reign to our gluttony and our excesses of abstinence in things which preserve our life the third is liberality which is the moderator of our giving and of our taking of temporal things the fourth is munificence which is the moderator of great expenditures making the same and arresting them at a certain limit the fifth is consciousness of greatness which is moderator and acquirer of great honors and fame the sixth is proper pride which moderates and regulates us as to the honors of this world the seventh is serenity which moderates our wrath and our excessive patience in the face of external evils the eighth is affability which makes us pleasant in company the ninth is called frankness which moderates us in speech from vaunting ourselves beyond what we are or deprecating ourselves beyond what we are the tenth is called eutropilia which moderates us in sports causing us to ply them in due measure the eleventh is justice which disposes us to love and to do righteousness in all things and each of these virtues has two collateral foes namely vices the one in excess and the other in defect and they themselves are the means between them and they all spring from one principle to wit from the habit of our right selection wherefore it may be said generally of all of them that they are in an elective habit consisting in the mean and these are they which make a man blessed or happy in their operation as saith the philosopher in the first of the ethics when he defines felicity saying that felicity is action in accordance with virtue in a perfect life it is true that prudence or sense is set down by many as a moral virtue but aristotle enumerates her amongst the intellectual virtues although she is the guide of the moral virtues and shows the way whereby they are combined and without her they may not be but be it known in this life we may have two felicities according to the two diverse paths the good and the best which lead us thereto the one is the active life and the other the contemplative which latter although by the active life we arrive as was said at a good felicity leads us to the best felicity and blessedness as the philosopher proves in the tenth of the ethics and christ affirms it with his mouth in the gospel of luke speaking to martha and answering her martha martha thou art anxious and dost trouble thyself about many things verily one only thing is needful that is to say the thing which thou art doing and he adds mary hath chosen the best part which shall not be taken from her and mary as it is written before these words of the gospel sitting at the feet of christ showed no concern for the ministry of the house but hearkened only to the words of the saviour for if we were to expound this morally our lord meant therein to show that the contemplative life was the best although the active life was good this is manifest to whoso will apply his mind to the gospel words but some might say arguing against me inasmuch as the felicity of the contemplative life is more excellent than that of the active 
and the one and the other may be and is the fruit and end of nobility why not proceed rather by way of the intellectual than by way of the moral virtues to this it may be answered briefly that in every discipline heed should be given to the capacity of the learner and he should be led by that path which is easiest to him wherefore inasmuch as the moral virtues seem to be and are more common and better known and more sought after than the other virtues and more closely knit with outward manifestation it was expedient and suitable to proceed by this path rather than by the other for we should arrive equally well at a knowledge of bees by investigating the product of wax as the product of honey though one and the other proceed from them end of section seventeen